Good morning, church. We are glad to have you here with us as we pray that this will be a blessed time in the Lord. We ask you to stand and begin to worship with us this morning. We're going to give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endureth forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endureth forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arms, His love endureth forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endureth forever. Sing praise, sing praise, come on, sing praise, sing praise, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. The setting sun His love endureth forever By the grace of God We will carry on His love endureth forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Y'all sing it out Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. I hope that uh, during this Thanksgiving time, how many of you feel like you ate too much? Even those of you watching online today. Okay, look, so this morning will be a great time for you to just, you know, every time you raise your hands in worship, it's actually like 10 pounds that you lose. And so, you know, so the more that you worship, the better it is for you this morning. I guarantee you it'll be a great time in the house of the Lord. We are so glad that you are here. Let me just give you a couple of quick announcements before we continue to worship the Lord together. We will have a business meeting tonight at 3.16 p.m. And so that'll be a great time together. But tonight is one of the annual traditions here at Westside that you will love if you've never been to one. We have our annual Hanging of the Green that is tonight. And so all these boxes you were saying, well, it looks kind of undone, doesn't look finished, there's nothing really on these trees. Well, tonight at 6 p.m. tonight, uh, we'll actually gather together. There will be some, uh, some garlands that go up from one side to the next, things out in the hallway, things upstairs in the balcony. Just an opportunity for us to gather together and we'll work. We'll sing a song and then we'll just start working. And at the end, when everything is in the dark, we'll sing silent night to candlelight and so if you haven't been if you're like well i'm not really in the christmas spirit it's you know just got done with thanksgiving and all this is a great time for families to gather together it's real casual we're literally working while we're singing and so there's a lot going on uh, we really need some guys who aren't afraid of getting on ladders and so I won't point you out, but if you don't mind climbing a ladder and putting a wreath up on the sides, we need your help tonight. And so we're looking forward to that. Don't forget, um, as we just begin to gather together, coming up in January of next year, I know it's a little while off, but January of next year, we have our um, a great outreach event. We need literally 74 people to join us uh, for the last, uh, last week of January, 28th, uh, the 30th, actually 30th, the 1st and 2nd of February. It'll be Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. We'll be hosting that. Even those of you who are watching online, we want to invite you to begin to think about that. As we get ready this morning, would you join me in prayer today? Father, we're so thankful to you that we can come to a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, and a God who has given us so much. And Father, as we give thanks to you for all that you've done, we remember to give back to you for all that you've given to us. And so whether it's our offering, our time, whether it's our whole lives, we just surrender that all to you. And we pray, Father God, that today you might be glorified in this service and this time together. For those who are not here, those who are watching online, we have a number of those. Father, we continue to pray your blessing upon them. 
for health and safety and for all those who have recently lost loved ones, we lift those folks up to you. But we celebrate a good God today and we thank you for all the ways that you work all things together for the good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would for a minute, our little kids will be dismissed for Children's Church. So if you want to meet Miss Tony there at the, uh, the side, y'all be good because if she tells me something, I'm going to get on to y'all later on. And so, um, so y'all enjoy that time together as we just come together this morning. Amen. We're just going to continue singing praises to his name. We have so many reasons to be thankful. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, for my soul.
Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You have no rival You have no equal Now and forever God you is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a powerful name Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name You sing like As you're seated this morning, amen, let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Just thankful for all that he has, he has done for us. Amen. Go ahead. Amen. You know, as we begin to um, just worship him, you can go ahead and turn that off for a minute. We got one more song for just a second before we do that. You know, one of the things that, um, that we want to do, and even those of you watching online this morning, as we think about how good God has been to us, the song says there's been 10,000 reasons. And look, what I want you to do if you're online, if you could just begin to type out one of the 10,000 reasons why you're thankful for the Lord this morning. But as a group this morning, as we gather together here live and in person in church, can, can I just hear from you? Um, the Bible says and this hymn says, you know what, we ought to give thanks to the Lord at all times and continually His praise ought to be on our, our lips. And the Bible says, look, name them one by one and it might even surprise you what the Lord has done. Do you have something that you're thankful for this morning as we come together as a church family? What are you thankful for today? forgiveness for Jesus salvation others today is there something that you are thankful for amen you're thankful look those of you online go ahead and, and, and put that in there you know this morning as we think about you you hopefully you during this Thanksgiving season have had a lot of opportunity to give the Lord thanks but I guarantee you as we continue our series of messages and we conclude this today, about how the Lord says, you know, there's nothing wasted in our lives. And he can take the hard times, the painful times, all those times. And if we look very closely, what we will see in the mountains and in the valleys, that there has been Jesus all the time. That through every part of your life, in the good and in the bad and the even the ugly, that Jesus says, I have been there. I'm a present help in times of trouble. And so as they sing this song for a moment, would you just listen? As you begin to listen, would you just give thanks to the Lord for all that he has done? And as you think about all that he has done, would you just say, you know what, in the middle of it all, there was Jesus. Listen as they sing for a minute. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand, I start to fall all the lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see them, but I could see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, 
Even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. Can waiting in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus on the mountain in the valley. There was Jesus in the shadows of the alleys. In the fire in the flood There was Jesus Always is and always was Was No, I never walk alone You always there Going and waiting In the searching in the healing and the heartache Like a blessing buried in broken pieces Oh, every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going No, I couldn't see it There was Jesus There was Jesus, amen? I mean, I hope that you know that this morning, that there, there, there was, was Jesus in the mountains and in the valleys and the hurting. And look, we, we as a community and we as a church and we and your own families have had a lot of things that have gone on recently to where, you know what, there, there had to be Jesus because you wouldn't have made it through these times. I mean, we've had tremendous loss and a lot of folks who've gone through and they're even, you know, the first Thanksgiving without a loved one in their family. They, they've experienced a lot of that, but yet in the middle of those times that there, there truly was was Jesus. And so Miss Helen and uh, Vicki and Roger and, and Dorothy, we just thank you for watching online. But as we gather together this morning, I come with a real simple, uh, simple message today, and it's this. God has a purpose in all of our pain. Sometimes when you don't realize that there's a purpose in things, it gets real meaningless and hopeless, and you begin to wonder, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. I don't like it. I don't appreciate it. Why has this had to happen in my life? And when everything is kind of a big blur of confusion, of anxiety, and of uncertainty, then you begin to feel hopeless and meaningless, but God has a purpose in your pain. As we've been looking over and we finish up today, Nothing is wasted. God can take all of those things in your life, all of those moments, all of that stuff that you begin to say why and what and how and where. He can take all of that and use it for a purpose. And so as you turn your Bible to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, even those of you watching online today, I encourage you to do that, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I just want to hear, just for the last time in the series, Hear for a moment what God says about every single thing that happens in your life. Every single thing. Some people call Romans 8, 28 a soft pillow for a tired soul. And so this morning, if you feel at times that your soul is tired, you've had enough of enough, it gets to that point of where you're just tired of it all, listen, friends, there is hope, there is a pillow, there is a reason 
Romans 8.28. When you have that and find it in your word, even those of you watching online with Cheetos in your hands or a cup of coffee because we can't drink in the sanctuary, we'll get in trouble for that. But if you have it today, Romans 8.28. If you got it in your Bible, you found that online, Bible app, papers, or whichever one you have, would you say amen if you're there with me today? Amen. Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Father, thank you that today there is a purpose. There is a reason that is bigger than us. There is a, a moment that for everything that has ever happened in life, that there has been Jesus through every valley and every mountaintop. Today, remind us of that. Point us to Jesus and help us to trust in him like never before. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated this morning. So Romans chapter 8, verse 28, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Hopefully it has become one of your favorite passages in the Bible as well. That God, as we look in that passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it begins with simple words like this. And we know. We don't think. We don't hope. We're not uncertain about this thing. No, it is an absolute certainty is what that word means. And we we know, without a shadow of a doubt, what do we know? Well, the Bible says that we know that all things, how many things? Remind yourself of that just this morning. We're going to look at verse 29 and 30. But for a moment, remind yourself this morning that every single thing, all things, work together. What do they do? They work together. It's that word synergy. They work together. The good, the bad, the other. He can turn all those things. He can work those two things together for good. Not that they're going to be good all the time. But he turns all of those things together for good. Now, we looked at last week that this is a conditional promise. You say, what does that mean, preacher? There is a condition that you and I must fulfill in order for God to say, I'm going to work out all those things for the good. He is not obligated to work out anything for the good except for these conditional promises for two things. And here's the condition for those who love God. Why would we love God? Because he first loved us. And so the Bible says, look, he works out all things together for the good of those who love God. Do you love him today? I mean, do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? That is the first and greatest commandment. That is what God desires of your life. You say, well, God wants me to do this, and priests are going to talk about tithing, and there's this little QR code that's in my pew, and he wants me to fill that out, and, and all those things that, you know, preachers tell you to do. Listen, friends, the Lord Jesus says the greatest commandment, if you boil it all down together, is that you might love God and love people. And so he says, look, for those who love God, that is the one who he says, I will work out all things together for the good. But he also gives us this word, those who have been called according to his, what? Purpose. That's the word that we want to focus on today is his purpose. In fact, if you look in your Bible, I want to read two more verses to you. Romans 8, verse 28 through 30. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. You follow along. Uh, Sally, you follow along in the version that you have before you. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Listen to what it says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For verse 29 says, for whom he foreknew, listen, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so this promise here in verse 28 is tied to the fact that we ought to love God and that we are the called according to his purpose. You say, what does that mean? Called according to his purpose. It means that those who are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, those who love him, who know him, who are known by him, that he says those are the called, those are the ones who have responded to the call of God by faith. It says in the Bible, you know, that, that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is the, the, the calling of God on our lives that we might accept Jesus Christ in our lives. But then in verse 30, look at verse 30 real quick. He gives us some words. And he says, look, this is the process of what God does for those who are the called according to his purpose. And, and these are some big words. We'll, we'll have more time later on to, to focus on these words. But it says this in verse 30. It says, those whom God foreknew, he, he predestined. You say, what does that mean? We'll look at that in a second. He predestined, and those whom he predestined, he called. And those who he called, it says he justified. And those who he justified, he glorified. There's a process of God working in our lives. His greater purpose in all of this, God's ultimate purpose, if we go from calling to receiving his call to the very end, God says, look, my ultimate purpose for your life is this, is that you might be glorified. 
You say, what does that word mean? Now, you ought to know that the ultimate reason that you exist is to bring God glory. We are not here today so that you can say, oh, that was a good message, preacher, and I appreciate that. It was not so that we could have some candles and some Christmas lights and focus on that kind of thing. No, the main reason for your life and the purpose of your life is that you might give God glory. You say, what does it mean to give God glory? It means to shine the light of every part of your life onto Jesus Christ. It means that in everything I do, whether word or deed, that I point it all towards Jesus. And so the Bible says, look, that is the ultimate purpose for our lives. But what does that look like? Because I don't really understand, how do you glorify the Lord? What does that look like? Well, thankfully, verse 29 gives us the answer. Verse 29, look at what it says in your Bible. Verse 29 simply says it this way. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Here's the purpose in your pain. If you ever wondered yourself, why did that happen? What's going on with this unknown part of my life? This doesn't make any sense. Why is that happening? Well, what could God take the, the pieces and the puzzles of my life? How could God use this? What is the purpose behind it? Well, listen, here's the purpose of our pain found in verse 29. You see, God says, I'll work all things together for the good. And this is where our hope is anchored because this shows us the purpose why he works out all things together. If you ever wondered what the purpose of and all that stuff is, let, let's just piece that together verse and word by word. It begins by saying this word, those whom God foreknew. You say, what does that mean, preacher? It means that God actually had a purpose for your life before you even knew about it. He knew that ahead of time. Before the creation of the world, if you begin to look in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, he says before the creation of the world, God already had a plan. He had a purpose. He's already working these things together. So the Bible says that he foreknew because he is all-knowing. He knows you and he knows the purpose and plans for your life. Let me say that again. He knows you. God knows you. He knows where you are. He knows what your life is about. He knows what you're doing right now. He knows what you're thinking right now. Isn't that a scary thought? If you believe right now that God knew everything that you are thinking right now. Whew. If I just look for a moment. Look at the person next to you. Can you read their mind? Look at them. I mean, just stare just for a second. Would you even want to read their mind if you could? Could you rewind their mind? If they, guys, if, they, if you really understood what she thought about you, that would be a scary, scary day. Some of y'all wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning, your mind is already racing. You're thinking about what's going on, and you're already writing notes, and you're already taking your phone and just begin to think. You know, some of y'all's minds never shut down. God says, look, I know that. Before a word is even on your tongue, God says, I foreknew that. I knew it all ready to happen. So, so the Bible here says that God foreknew. He knew you. He knew his plan for you. He knew the purpose for your life. And he says that those whom he foreknew, he also did something. This is a big word. We got, and I'll just theologically say this. If you're here today and you're wondering, I wonder if the preacher is a Calvinist. Listen, we won't go into that, but the preacher is not one. All right. So, you know, I, I, there are some things about predestined and election and things that are in the Bible. And I'm not going to refute that. But this whole idea that God is going to just uh, just scarcely say oh, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. And that, that, that just, you know, there's other reasons there. So so just theologically, so you know that I am not one of them. But this word predestined is in the Bible. You say, what does that word predestined mean? It means that God has predetermined a destination, even when you're not even on the right path yet, that God is working. You, you say, let me tell you to you this way. Last Sunday after church, we had that funeral, and I just want to say it. Woo! Thank you, Church of God at Westside, because your, your willingness to transform this sanctuary into a place where they could have that funeral and that the Lord could be glorified. Y'all showed up and showed out. And as your pastor, man, I appreciate that so much because it, I couldn't have done it without y'all and we had to do that in the quickness and y'all were able to, to really minister to that family by taking care of that last week. But, but after the funeral and all, um, we went with the Boyettes to the mountains. Anybody love, some people said, that's God's country right there, you know, going to the, the mountains, you know, Gatlinburg and stuff. And so we went to the Smokies. He even showed me a verse in Psalm uh, like 134, isn't it like 130, 134, where it's like, you know, God touched the mountains and the smoke came on the mountains. It was like, ooh, well, I didn't even read that verse before. But it was a, it was a pretty, pretty moment. But we drove up there on, on Sunday. We left here about 3.30. We got there about 3.30 in the morning because of time change and all. And then the next day, Day, the Boyettes have this thing where they like to go to the mountains and go, they have mountains and trails and hiking and stuff. 
I don't know if that's your purpose in going to the mountains. Um, I didn't know it was my purpose in going to the mountains either. But waking up on that Monday morning, and we're excited to go up. And Hawaiians have really thin skin. Not just because, like, you know, you'll hurt my feelings if you say I'm bald-headed and stuff. I'm talking about, like, you know, thin skin, like it gets cold up in the mountains and stuff. And so here we are. We're going up there. But I had no idea where we were going. They were like, let's go up to Clingman's blah, 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 and let's go see the chimney tops, and let's go, you know, here, and then all these places, you know. So I didn't know what that meant, but they knew already because they'd been there. They foreknew exactly where we were going and how much time we'd spend here, and, and maybe it took a little bit longer on the hiking because my breath and my lung capacity after, you know, this COVID season, you know, I don't have the, the lung capacity and all, and it's higher elevation. Like, we were like, what, 20,000 feet up in the air? You know, I don't even know where we were, because why? I just went along for the ride. They foreknew it. They already knew. He'd like this. This would be enjoyable to them. We got a four by four. We can go off in these little trails. They knew the destination. They already foreknew what would be the places that we would want to go. And because they knew all that, they predetermined what the route would be. They'd say, hey, where do you want to go? I'm like, I ain't never been here before. Where do you want to go? And so you know what? We went to all those places that they said this would be cool. So we went there all Monday and then we left on Tuesday at like 1230 in the afternoon. So I, I don't know if any of you love going to the mountains. It was the most enjoyable enjoyable, quick moment in my entire life, going for like two days and 12 of it or 14 of it, 20 of it was driving. And so it was an exciting, exciting time. But what are you saying, preacher? God says, I foreknew and I predestined. I already know the plan and the purpose that I have for your life. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has an ultimate purpose. He's already set it into motion. So what is the destination? If God says, this is what I know, and this is where we're going to go, and this is the purpose in all of your pain, what is the destination that God wants to show you his glory? Well, look at the rest of verse 29. This is what you ought to underline. This is what you ought to write down. This is what you ought to focus on for just a moment. Verse 29 simply says that God did all of these things. Why? In order to conform you to the image of his son. You say, what are you talking about? God's purpose in your life is the fashion to mold, to conform you into the image of his son that you might resemble the family resemblance because you are one of his children that you might resemble the Lord. Now, some of y'all have that little deer in the headlights looking, so let me explain it to you this way. Let's go back to kindergarten. Y'all ready for kindergarten? Let's go back to kindergarten. Anybody here used to play Play-Doh? Anybody know what I'm talking about Play-Doh? Y'all got Play-Doh in Louisiana? I mean, we didn't have it in Germany, but when I moved to Alabama, I found out what Play-Doh was and stuff. So in Germany, we didn't have it. But anybody here remember Play-Doh? All right, you understand? Know just shake your head like this. This is yes, this is no. Play-Doh. Okay, good. Because some of y'all maybe used to eat Play-Doh instead of play with Play-Doh, right? Okay, good. I saw a lot more response to that. Back in the day when you would have Play-Doh in that little yellow container, not the cheap kind, but the, like the real Play-Doh kind, what you'd have is in that container, you'd have the blue and the red and the yellow and stuff. And so you'd have that Play-Doh in that container. You would take it out before it got dry and crusty. And what you could do is you could actually take that Play-Doh. You know, some of y'all had the little spaghetti strainer. I never had one of those. I wasn't cool enough to get the, you know, you push it. It's like, ooh, spaghetti and stuff. Some of y'all may remember, though, there are these things that you could actually take with the Play-Doh. If you weren't created enough to make a worm or a snake, and you don't quite know how to make things happen with Play-Doh, what you could oftentimes do, they had a little plastic mold. And that plastic mold would be in the shape of something, maybe a little truck, a car, a shell, or whatever. And you'd take that plastic mold, and you'd hold it like this, and you'd take that glob of Play-Doh, and you'd stick it in there. And when you would stick that Play-Doh in there, you'd shut the lid on it, you'd press it together real good, and guess what came out whenever you opened up that lid and you peeled back the Play-Doh? What came out? The exact image of whatever it was conformed and molded into. It pressed it, it formed it, it conformed to that image of that Play-Doh. Why? Because that image was stamped and pressed onto that Play-Doh. You say, What does Play-Doh have to do with the purpose in my pain? Listen to it. It says that God has done all of these things to conform you into the image of his son. So what are you talking about? For those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who love him and those who are the called according to God's purpose, the Bible says that God's ultimate purpose, he predestined this, his purpose and plan for your life is that you might then be conformed and pressed and molded into the very image of Jesus Christ And the way that he does that most effectively, the way that he molds you into the shape of Jesus, the way that he's able to take all of your stuff and conform it and take away and add and move, the way that he does that is through pain in our lives. We love the good times. 
Oh, we thank the Lord and we'll give him thanks for every blessing and every good thing that's happened in our health and our family and our wealth and our possessions. We give him thanks for all of those things. But sometimes the blessings do not conform and mold us and change us as much as those hard times that cause us to press into Jesus, those difficult times that cause us to pray a little bit more than we often have been. It begins to just cause us to say, Jesus, I need you. I've depended upon you. I want more of you. And when that begins to happen, what does the Lord do? He adds and subtracts. He takes away all the excess stuff. And when he unfolds that mold, he begins to go and make you more and more like, like Jesus. I decided, and I wasn't sure if I liked this, and Heather, I'll go ahead and give my vote of approval. I decided that, you know what? I at first thought, you know what? I'm a beach kind of guy. I mean, you can look and be like, oh, them Hawaiians and stuff. They just, I could. I could live on the beach, sit on the beach. I've got a brother in Hawaii who is strung out on stuff right now, but he, lo- he lives in a tent on the beach in Hawaii. Besides the strung out part, I would like sit there right, right beside him, and I would love every minute. You could just get me, you know, get me some coconuts and, you know, like three crackers and some spam, and I could live there the rest of my life. Get me on a beach at any moment. So I didn't really think, like, you know, the mountains, the cold. I'm I'm wearing wool socks. I ain't even I had wool socks in my life before, but you know, my feet got cold. I got three little things that you shake it up and I put it in my pocket in my back pocket too, because my butt got cold. And so here I am. I'm in the middle of this place. It's freezing cold in the middle of these mountains, but I got them little warmers and I'm up there and, and, and I, I figured out, you know what, Heather, I, I can handle this every once in a while, like once every seven years or so. I could, I could handle the mountains because there's some country stuff in the mountains that I really enjoy. There's some country stuff up there that you can't really get anywhere. All of a sudden, we crossed into Tennessee, and I was like, man, you know what? I want some fudge. I don't even like fudge, but like, you know, suddenly like fudge and taffy were like, just like, you know, man, that just seems like I ought to eat some of that. We went to some little restaurant. When they brought out my food, it was in a like cast iron skillet, and literally the skillet was as big as this pulpit. It had inside of it some grits, and I don't eat grits, but all of a sudden I tasted some because I was like, I'm in Tennessee. I might as well taste some grits. I had some eggs. I had this little like, you know, corn fritter looking thing. I had a pancake, which is about like two inches thick. I mean, it was good kind of pancake. I had some syrup. I don't even know if it was like real syrup or straight out the tree, but we enjoyed every part of that. And so here I am, I'm eating pancakes, fudge, I got coffee, and something out of like Tennessee water straight out of the spring and stuff. I don't even drink well water and stuff, but something about that that spring water in Tennessee, it's like, look, I went to a stream, I took my hand, I went like this little... And I drank some out of a stream. I, you know, I don't know if I was feeling bad afterwards or not, but it was like, it's Tennessee. That's what you do in Tennessee. You just take bear water and just like, you know, drink it and stuff. I mean, it was a great time. But one of the things that we did while I was over there, I kind of looked, and I was too cheap to actually go because, you know, like Gatlinburg money is like Disney money and stuff. So, you know, we just kind of walked around, looked at stuff, and, you know, grabbed a cup of coffee here and there. But one of the things, the cool things that they had in this place was this. They had this thing called a, I think it's the right word, a place where you could forge a knife. You ever seen one of them? You know, uh, Brother Ruben got me a knife. I still got my knife and stuff. You know, I still got that. But, but you know, they, 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 they got a, a knife place where you could make your own. You know, one of them like kind that's got the, you know, different layers and stuff, like Damask steel. Is that right? You know, some of y'all, I, I've watched Forge with Fire and stuff. And so, you know, uh, so they had that, all that cool stuff. You know, you could make one that had a little hook on it and stuff. You know, you get, I don't even know what, you know, a Bowie knife or Bowie knife, whatever that thing is. You, know, you, you, you could make you a knife right up there. This is how I heard that they make these knives. When you look into the window and kind of see those guys, Brother Bill, you're kind of looking at them like, ooh, wow, that's, that's fire, fire, hot, hot fire, fire, you know, Tennessee fire. While we were there looking at this fire, this is what I began to realize, is that they would take this metal, whatever it might be, and they'd take it and they put it in this little smelting pot. When they put it in this smelting pot, they would begin to turn the heat up. And what they would do is that all of a sudden that heat inside of that pot, it would begin to allow that metal to begin to kind of boil and trickle up and, and they'd have this stuff on the top of it and they would begin to just kind of scoop that away. Supposedly that stuff on the top would be like dross, it's impurities, it's things that aren't needed, it's things that you don't want inside there because it would mess up the purity of that thing that you're trying to create. And So they would heat it and as they heated it up it began to remove the dross and that dross would begin to just be skimmed off until finally it would be just what you wanted it to look like to be molded into the shape that you wanted it to, to be forged with fire, to have that hammer applied to it, to be shaped right into how you wanted it shaped. And the way that I heard a blacksmith was able to tell when that material was ready to be used is when he would begin to look into that pot 
and he removed all the dross. And after a while, when he saw his own reflection, that's when he knew that it was ready to be used after it had been forged in the fire. Chew on this for a minute. Some of y'all are looking at the painful moments of your life, and man, it's like it's, somebody's turning the heat up in my life. It's uncomfortable in my relationships. It's uncomfortable in my job. I'm really not feeling it when it comes to all the pain and stuff that I'm going through. And it's like, why is this right here seem like it's burning up? Why is this person being removed out of my life? Why is this not happening in the time scale that I want it to? And it just seems like it ought to be done. And things are being heated up and taken away and removed out of my life. And I look back to when I was a little kid and this happened. I look back when I was a young adult and that happened. I look back at all these moments of my life and it doesn't make any sense. Who is turning up the heat? Why is this happening? And what are they trying to mold and press me into? And I don't like it very much. And the Lord says, you know what I'm doing? You know what I'm doing, child of God? I'm turning up the heat in your life because I have a purpose in your pain. I'm going to go and remove some things out of your life because that thing is nothing but dross and dead weight. And I need to skim that off of the very top of your life. I need to just begin to move and motion and function some things in your life, rearrange some things in your life. Why? So that in the end, the ultimate purpose is, is that when people look at us, they no longer see us, but they see the reflection of the Father. Because why? Because we are conforming to ourselves to the very image of God himself through Jesus. Christ. You see, the reason why some of the stuff has happened in your life, and listen to me, friends, the reason why some of that stuff has gone on in your life, the reason why some of those things are as painful as they have been in your life is because God says, this is an area of your life that you are not like Jesus. This is an area of your life that, boy, you've got an idol here. You've held on to this thing right here. And if I don't take that thing away, you'll never be more like Christ than by keeping this thing. So I need to remove that. I need to add this thing. I need to put a little trial here, a little tribulation there. Because all these things begin to happen in your life to form and fashion. And God has an ultimate foreknowledge and purpose through all of it. Why? Because he wants to see his own reflection in you. He can take a lot of blessings. He could take a lot of things that would be good in your life and you say, well, that's the thing that drew me to Jesus. No, that's the thing that causes you to give praise and thanks to Jesus. But you know what draws you to Jesus? I realize I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. I realize I can't make it on my own because I'm about to lose my mind. I'm about to lose my family. I'm about to lose everything in my life. And all of a sudden, all of that hard stuff is something that God uses. God can take the things that he hates in order to accomplish the thing that he loves. That ain't original for me. Somebody else said it. But listen to me. It just meant a lot to me when I heard it this past week. God can take the things that he hates in order to accomplish the thing that he loves. God hates that sin. He hates the way that things are destroyed in your life. He hates those things that are, are, are just being uh, still killed and destroyed in your life. And God can take all of those things that you would say to yourself, you know what? That right there is something that, that God would hate. Why is he allowed this hateful person in my life? Why does God allow this sinful thing in my life? And he says, I've used all of that. For your glory. Why? Because he'll glorify us, but in the end, it's to glorify him. It is all about Jesus Christ. And I'll give you an example of that today. There's this guy in the Bible whose name was Joseph. If there's ever been a guy in the Bible who has gone through stuff, it is Joseph. You may remember the story. He was abandoned. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. He ended up in a house where he was falsely accused of, of, of mistreating a woman while he was there. He was sent into prison while he was in prison. He was there and he got forgotten in that prison while he was there. He'd been separated from his uh, whole family for, for years, decades literally. And he'd been gone through all this stuff. But you know what the Bible says? That in the middle of all this stuff, it says that the Lord was with Joseph. There was Jesus. The Lord was with him all the while. And in every hard time, in every pit, palace, and prison while he was in there, God was working, God was that moving in his life, that there was Jesus. In the middle of this, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says, look, in the end of it all, when I don't know the purpose and the plan and the reason for all this, he says, what all of y'all intended in my life for evil, God has purposed all of that. He has meant it for good. Why? Because the ultimate good happened this way. When they took Joseph and they threw him in the prison, they didn't realize that in the end of it all, that Joseph would actually to be the one who would save the Israelites and out of that save, uh, saving of Israelites he would save Judah and out of the tribe of Judah would one day come the Lord Jesus Christ and if there's ever a reason in the middle of this pain it is so that we could be focused pointed, shaped, surrounded living in Jesus Christ that is the purpose my friends, in your pain it is that God could actually take all of those things that make no sense and listen to me I know some of your stories, and there's a lot of stuff that makes no sense at all. 
There's a lot of stuff that's been hurtful and painful. The loss of someone who should have never died in the first place. The, 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 the reality of somebody leaving you who should have been there the whole time. The reality of things that haven't turned out in your life and one thing led to another and all that painful stuff has just ended up being just, just too much to handle. And sometimes you say, why in the world did all of that stuff happen? And maybe the Lord is saying this. I allowed it. He doesn't cause it, but I allowed it to happen for the greater purpose that in that pain, it might draw you to Jesus. That in that moment of weakness, in that moment of sorrow, in that moment of question and doubt, instead of saying why, you begin to say what. God, what are you trying to add? What are you trying to subtract? What are you trying to do to make me more and more like Jesus? I didn't get a knife that day. I didn't get any boots that day either. I was trying to get a deal with Dwayne. See, Dwayne's a boot wearer. He got some of them kind of like, you know, pythons and, and marathons and all those other kind of boots and stuff. He got, he got a lot of boots. His favorite ones are these gray, and they're like, you know, what are the things made out of? Elephant. Elephant. So here was what I thought. I thought since, you know, the brother making offshore kind of money and stuff, and what I thought is they had this one store there, I think it was in like a Pigeon Forge greatest store ever if it would have happened the way that in my mind it should have happened because see what they did was that they had a buy one get two free get two free so I'm thinking to myself I'm like brother Dwayne you buy one you get one free and I don't mind the free one either hey. <laughs> because you already paid for one you get one free I mean, this little spare one, you know, you don't need the anaconda, the fish one, the, you know, you don't need the one that's got like, you know, the, the, the little square looking or little ostrich thing with the little, you know, looks like it's cold outside, got a little goosebumps on it. You don't, you don't need that extra one right there. I mean, that's my description of cowboy boots. And so, so I was like, you buy the one and I'll get the one free. That sounds like good math to me, right? It's good math to me. He didn't bite on it though. <laughs> Because he was thinking I could get three and that would, you know, fractions and all that kind of stuff. So he didn't quite agree with my way of thinking. But here's what I know. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross, he bought one. And now we all get in free. You say, what does that mean? He says he, he bought the price for the salvation of all mankind. And he bought one because he paid the one price that was necessary and now we get the gift of, of salvation through, through him. And so the Bible says, you know, that he predestined that, he called that. And those who he called, he begins to justify it. And then the end result of that is that they glorify him. Where there's no more crying, sickness, or pain. There's no more having to deal with the things of this earth, the world, and the sickness, and the sin, and the shame of all this stuff that happens in this world. And so it's simply a, a gift. A gift that has been paid for because the price has been paid in full. And now he gives you us this gift that if we just accept the gift. You know what I would have done? And y'all encourage your deacon brother uh, Dwayne next time we ever go to the mountains and stuff. Well, if y'all want to take me to the mountains, let's go together. You know, I, I didn't have to drive the whole time, and so praise the Lord. I, I did chip in for gas because y'all were like, that dude is cheap right there. You know, I, I paid a little gas money here and there. But you know what would happen? If he'd be like, hey, hey, brother Marcus, you know, I'll get the one, get the other one free. You get you some elephant boots. I'm like, nah. I got my one from the Williams boys, and so, you know, I got mine, and I got my one pair. You know what? That'd been crazy. Because as much as I like America, and them boots is nice, you know, a little, little church boot wouldn't hurt none. I would have said yes. Same with the Lord. We get so prideful, and we think to ourselves, I don't, I don't need that free gift. You can't predestine yourself. You can't call yourself, you can't justify yourself, and you won't be able to glorify yourself in heaven. The only thing you can do is say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. In a moment, our band's going to come up. We're going to sing this song that says, Lord, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy promise, I'm just coming to you by faith in Jesus Christ, just as I am. 
The good thing is, today the altar will be open. I'll be standing at the front if you need to make a decision for Christ, whatever that might be. As you make that decision for Christ, I want to encourage you with something. That you can come to him just as you are. The good thing is, he won't keep you that way. Because as you come to him just as you are, the end result is, is that he'll work, he'll justify, and then ultimately he will glorify to make you more and more like Jesus. If there is one area in your life today that is not like Jesus, listen to me strongly, friend. If there is one area of your life that you are not like Christ, you don't look like Christ, you don't act like Christ, you don't talk like Christ, your attitude is nothing like Christ, then that is the area of your life that Jesus says, we need to work on that. I'm going to mold some things. I'm going to take some things away. You better conform yourself. He will either let you conform yourself and willingly, or he will press you and mold you until there's no other way for you to just say, yes, Jesus, I will accept what you're doing. And he will press and mold and to get you more and more like him. So maybe the altar is open for you to say, I need to give this thing right with Jesus. Father, I thank you for each person who's here today. Thank you for those who are watching us online. God, there has to be a purpose in our pain, and I know that it's to make us more like Christ. Lord, we claim today that nothing is wasted when it's in the hands of Almighty God. And so, Lord, today we place our whole life in your hand. Our past, our present, even our future, we place it into the hands of Almighty God. And today we declare, Lord, that that, that nothing, nothing is wasted in your hand. And so, Father, this morning, if there's somebody here who's never given their life to Christ, they've never been justified, They've never known what it's like to have the free forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, that today, by faith, they say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you in my life. Lord, I I can't make another day. I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we surrender this time to you. But, Father, today we also come to you, Father, just saying, Lord, make us more like Jesus. Make us more like Jesus in every area. By word and deed, may we glorify Christ. May we give thanks to you in all times, even today. May we declare the goodness of God in the land of the living. So, Lord, we thank you for this invitation time. May you have your way as we come to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand with us today as we just begin to sing this song together. You know, as we, uh, as we close today, I hope that you know that this morning, that you can come to the Lord just as you are. And here's the good news. He won't keep you that way. He will mold and move and shape in ways that we can just say, Lord, it's never been about me. It's always been about you. It's all because of your grace and mercy. And so I just want to close this morning just with that chorus as we just sing, Lord, I come broken. Why? 
because you mend me, you mold me, you shape me. And so let's sing that together this morning. Let's declare that today, that we can come to the Lord just as we are. Say, Lord, I'm broken, but you mend me and you fix me and you heal me every single time. Let's sing that together this morning. And I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. Come on, sing it together. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Praise God, just as Well, friends, this morning, before we are dismissed, I want to give a, a quick word of announcement. Don't forget, not only are we having our business meeting tonight, um, Kai, go ahead and, uh, you can go ahead and wrap us out of the uh, live stream, and we'll just have a uh, little, little moment together as the church.